Thanks so much for joining today's Silver Spring webinar on the path to a smarter city, from smart streetlights to smart cities. As we've been working with both municipalities and utilities, we're seeing a lot of overlap in some of the issues that they're facing, some of the increasing complexity in their environments. So both cities and utilities are struggling with economic issues, trying to build much more operational efficiency into their service delivery. We're seeing much more active citizen involvement, so both at the citizen level and in terms of how utilities are engaging with consumers, that's on the increase. Both utilities and cities are dealing with increasingly stringent environmental regulations and looking to be better corporate citizens in terms of how they're treating the environment. We're seeing in, in a lot of areas a very big focus on carbon monetization with municipalities needing to meet specific carbon reduction goals and doing carbon monitoring in various parts of the city to try to understand what those levels are. And so we're seeing a lot of overlap between the, the kinds of issues that they're struggling with and a lot of common goals in how they want to approach next generation services. We're just in the earliest days of a very interesting convergence. So utilities have been building smart grid platforms for some time, looking to build a common network to unify their infrastructure and connect out to homes and businesses throughout their service territory. At the same time, we're seeing the emergence of smart city platforms. And again, a unifying network to link citizens and a whole variety of services and tie that in with municipal government. The interesting convergence is the opportunity to have both smart grid platforms and smart city platforms taking advantage of common infrastructure, leveraging a common network, for example, and also perhaps where possible, taking advantage of common software to drive a whole host of interesting services. Both smart grid platforms and smart city platforms have a couple of known technology laws that they can take advantage of. So the first that's been known for quite some time is Moore's Law. The notion that computing power is always increasing for lower price every year. There's also a law called Metcalfe's Law, which talks about the value of a network. So as the cost to connect comes down, there's a simultaneous effect where the value of the network is actually increasing as you're connecting more devices on that platform. So these laws work sort of in the inverse of each other, but they really drive up the value of a scaled network that's hosting a whole bunch of devices and delivering a whole bunch of applications. So Silver Spring has been developing what we call the platform for the everything network for quite some time. In our earliest days, we were focused on connecting meters, and then that grew over time to represent not just smart meters, but the broader energy network or smart grid network with a whole range of different devices connected. The US has led the wave, but a whole bunch of international communities are now also rapidly building out energy networks. And this is quickly transitioning to smart city networks. And so we're seeing a whole host of other kinds of devices and technologies that we can bring together to make cities more competitive. And all of this is moving toward the path of the Internet of Things. Silver Spring likes to talk about it as the Internet of Important Things, but bringing together a whole host of devices connected on a large scale, ubiquitous network and delivering rich data. One of the early interesting devices that we're focused on in moving into smart city networks and eventually the everything network is the focus on streetlights. So why is it interesting to network streetlights? What are some of the drivers to do this and, and how does this become then a foundational building block for a smarter city? So it turns out there are a range of both energy efficiency and operational efficiency reasons that you want to not just use better lighting, more efficient lighting, but actually network those lights. So in terms of energy efficiency, there are a lot of savings to be had moving to a combination of both more efficient lighting, that is often LED lighting, but also taking those LEDs and networking them. Together, we're looking at the, an opportunity for really significant savings, as much as 65% as you see here. We'll go into this in more detail on the next slide. What these kinds of savings let um, the, the utility or the municipality do is achieve 
really interesting, maybe local or statewide EE or energy efficiency targets. If they can reduce their energy use from, again, more efficient lighting and better control of that lighting, then they have an easier time meeting those targets. This is really fundamental to places that are subject to carbon monetization, where cities are already subject to carbon, either carbon limits or the need to reduce their carbon footprint over time. In addition to the energy efficiency opportunities, there is a whole host of operational efficiency opportunities, and these are mostly derived from networking the lights. So it's not just about getting a more efficient bulb in place, but also networking that for control. And one of the big sources of savings is in maintenance savings. So the opportunity, there's a lot of cities around the world that actually do nightly truck rolls to look for lights that are out or lamps that are out. You can avoid that, understand what's going on from an outage perspective, and bring the right equipment to the right job when you do need to perform maintenance when you can network those devices. Better control over lighting also has a lot of other positive effects for the community. Increasing the safety in the area is a big deal. So there's been a direct tie between better lighting, more consistent lighting, and controlled lighting with a reduction in crime. It's been estimated to be as high as a 10% reduction in crime if you can ensure that the lights are consistently on and, and public venues are well lit. The other major operational benefit by having the network connectivity and always knowing the state of the lights is the increase in reliability. Rather than waiting for a citizen to call a, a city line, a city phone line, for example, to report an outage, the municipality or the utility will know right away that a light is out. So let's look at a couple of these statistics around efficiency in a little bit more detail. So at the energy efficiency level, the ability to network the lights really offers some great capabilities that reduce energy usage. So the ability to do remote dimming, you can do this to stay in sync with time, but you can also do this where you're setting particular hours of the night where you know that traffic is low and so it would be fine to bring the lighting down another level. So you might have dusk level lighting and certain lighting levels up to maybe 11 p.m., but then your traffic congestion studies would show to you that between 11 p.m. and 5 a.m., for example, you might be able to take lighting levels down as much as 50% because there's just not enough traffic in the area to warrant the brighter bulbs. Then you bring those back online at 5 a.m. to be fully lit again as morning traffic is getting started. The other thing that you can do is be a lot more granular about the specific runtime. So when exactly do you want the lights coming on? And you can be much more specific about ramping that down as summer hours are coming on and then ramping back up for winter. The other element is that a lot of lights have uh, higher levels of, burn, of burning levels of lumens um, than you may need. And so your ability to reduce that over prov provisioning can reduce the wasted energy because you don't need them to be at that brighter level. Shifting over to the operational side, the 90% figure that you see here, this has been calculated by cities where they actually do run those nightly truck rolls to identify lamps that are out of service. So on a more average basis, when cities are not using those nightly truck rolls, the operational reduction is more around 65%. But again, the, the idea of recognizing when lamps are out, knowing the equipment that you need to go serve, and then protecting those uh, devices in terms of not having them run as bright, stabilizing the light level throughout the life of the LED, all of these facets can really increase the length of service that those lights can have, and that really reduces your O&M costs over time. A nice artifact of networking all these really high up points all throughout your city is that you're strengthening the network at the same time that you're enabling this new service. You're rolling out a communicating endpoint to all these locations throughout your city and those devices can then in turn help strengthen the network and host a whole range of other applications. So we've seen some municipalities where the economics for AMI alone 
uh, advanced metering and bringing those kinds of meter reading benefits onto a network where that business case may not stand on its own, but tying together streetlights and AMI does create a positive business case. But there's a whole other range of applications that this, this strengthened network will serve. So in the utility world, things like demand response where you're managing peak load, that's greatly enhanced with a stronger network with more communicating endpoints throughout the infrastructure. And then within the smart city, having public charging of EVs or electric vehicles, for example, another way where building out the network is, is offering infrastructure for additional city applications. Managing traffic lights is another great example. And again, you're talking about an endpoint nice and high, um, building that network out in a broad array throughout your city. So just as Silver Spring has brought the notion of multiple smart grid applications onto the smart grid and a common network, we're applying the same philosophy to smart cities. Build a common network on which you can run multiple smart city applications. You're going to get a much greater return on your investment and all your future applications will roll out more quickly and more cost efficiently. We see smart lighting as just the beginning of a whole range of smart city applications. So there's a lot of different aspects that different cities are pursuing, but there's surveillance technology that's going on. We're seeing those kinds of surveillance applications happening for, at both the video and audio level. There's all sorts of sensors getting deployed. We talked about carbon monetization and cities monitoring their pollution levels throughout the city. We're seeing that for not just pollution but also noise levels and then water metering and all sorts of applications. We talked about the need for public infrastructure to support electric vehicle charging. There's also opportunities for communication networks and advertising panels to be leveraged where the city can get more information out to its citizens. Public lighting beyond streets, so park infrastructure and things like that, and having a lot of control over where you bring up lighting, you know, following a given event, for example, you can really light up the areas leaving that venue so that it makes it really easy for the crowds to get to the areas they need to get to. And then traffic lights, another great application of networked infrastructure. We've seen cities, you know, Vancouver, for example, during the Olympics with intelligent traffic control was able to support a doubling of its city ridership with even with one fewer bus than it typically had in service because they were able to implement intelligent traffic control. So just a whole host of applications that can come onto this common network when you when you build out that that scalable, ubiquitous, high performing network to serve your whole smart city. So we really see that network choice as the beginning point for charting a path to a smarter city. Rather than making a series of isolated decisions that said, well, what's the cheapest way I could network my streetlights? And what's the cheapest way I could network the surveillance system? Thinking about it very broadly and saying, I'm gonna make the right network choice from the beginning is really the better path for you because you'll be able to do a lot more on common infrastructure and you'll have much lower costs over time. When you're able to support multiple applications on that common network, every new application will be much lower in cost. And that'll be not just a capital implication for you, but also an operational implication, because now you're just running one network with one security architecture, and you're leveraging that cost across a whole range of applications. And at Silver Spring here, we're very proud of our heritage in delivering highly scalable, highly reliable networks. We've proven it in the smart grid, we're proving it in smart city applications with smart street lights, and we believe we can be a foundational technology for you to enable your smart city vision. We look forward to hearing from you. Please reach out to us at smartcity at silverspringnet.com for any additional information or if we can answer any questions for you. Thanks so much.